Hello and welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by none other than Aquarium Co-op. Now, you're probably thinking I'm going to plug one of the hundreds of quality products that Aquarium Co-op carries during this promo. But no, no, my friends, I'm going to promote community. So now, what exactly is Randy talking about? Well, if you didn't know, Aquarium Co-op has a new forum out called CARE which stands for Community Aquarists Respect Each Other. The whole goal is to create an environment where fish nerds can come together and talk about just that, fish nerdy stuff in all its glory. Leave the fighting and name calling to other social media platforms. This is an old school forum with new school features where everyone is encouraged to share their Aquarist experiences and adventures. I've been having a great time on the forum so far, sharing updates and projects in my fish room posting up Aquarium Co-op related warehouse photos, and seeing some amazing tanks and projects being carried out by other forum members. So come on over to forum.aquariumcoop.com and create an account and jump in on the action. If you missed the website address, it was forum.aquariumcoop.com, and I'll leave a link in the show notes. Now, on to the interview. Today's date is Friday, November 6th, 2020. My guest today is Cole Hopkins. Cole is the president of the Southern California Aquatic Plant Enthusiast Club, which is more commonly known as SCAPE. So, Cole, welcome to the podcast. All right, good to be here. Awesome. Yeah, glad we were able to connect and uh, just kind of have a couple fish nerds nerd out. And I'm sure that you are going to give me uh, a couple lessons here on aquascaping, even though I know, you know, in past conversation, you're not exactly, you know, 100% into the aquascaping like you were, and you've kind of shifted over to fish breeding a little bit, but I still think nonetheless... Um, we're going to get some good nuggets out of you. So, so Cole, where, where does your journey start? Where, what is your origin story? How did you get into the hobby? Uh, well, the earliest I can remember aquariums is, um, my dad always had aquariums when we were growing up. And I remember being five, six years old and us having a 55 gallon tank with an Oscar and a Paku. Um, which probably should have never been in the same tank with a, let alone a 55, but, um, yeah, we made it work. And then I remember having salamanders, um, in the aquariums as well. Um, my dad had reptiles with a, he, uh, used a 180 gallon aquarium that he built out of, um, he has stories of telling me of his, uh, the red devils that he used to take care of back in the sixties and the seventies. And he was a really big fish nerd. So he got me into it. And then when I got my own place, I went out and got a little 10 gallon tank, just had a little red and black gravel. Um, I ended up having a, a convict cichlid and a common pacostomus in a 10 gallon tank, which should, shouldn't have happened. But, um, and then a couple of years, I, I got rid of that tank and was without a tank for a few years. And about three, four years ago, I found Scape. Um, started out with a 10 gallon tank. I went to one of the meetings. Um, I ended up uh, converting an older 29 gallon tank into my first Aquascape after one of the meetings that I found. Um, I won a five, I won a 10 gallon rimless tank for like five bucks in the auction, which that that just set me off. And after that, I just went down the we call it multi tank syndrome. I got I got that really really bad. Good old MTS man. Let's uh yep. l- let's jump back in the time machine. So when you're a kid, I, I don't think I've ever asked anybody this before. I, I definitely know that I've commented on just kind of that Oscar fifty five gallon being just uh more often than not. I think people. Uh, I think you, you and I are, are pretty close in age to each other, but you know our generation. I think we all have these very fond memories of a parent or an aunt or an uncle or somebody that had that fifty-five gallon with the Oscar in it. Did you have the fear as a child that like that the Oscar was like a piranha, and then if you put your finger in there, it would bite it off? Uh, not not too much about the Oscar, but I I, I know what you're talking about. Um, we all know somebody who had a 55 gallon with an Oscar at one point. The the fish that I was afraid of was the Paku. Um, the Paku, it's a uh, it's I believe it's the cousin of the piranha. Um, down here in the California, we can't get piranha. It's not legal here. Um, the closest thing we can get is are the red belly or the red belly Pakus. And those things will go grow as big around as a basketball, if not bigger. Um, 
So it's like a super sized piranha. That was the one that I was always afraid of because my my dad would drop go, uh, feeder fish in there, and you know the uh, the Oscar just pretty much swallows them whole, but the Paku tears them to shreds. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> good times. Yeah, but you know that that like childhood fear of like, oh, that's a big fish. It's gonna bite your finger off. I just feel like that was such a prevalent thing. Um, you know, I think maybe my aunt might have had a fifty five gallon in it. More than likely had an Oscar in it, but it had something where it was like, oh, don't put your finger in there. That thing's going to bite it. Oh, yeah. You never wanted to stick your hand inside the tank, especially when you see him feed live, live stuff to him. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious. Uh, do you know how your dad got his start? Um, I believe when him and my mom first got married, he said that he went out and got, I think it was a 45-gallon bow front tank, and he had a a red devil in it that it, it, it's very fond stories of his red devil. He tells me the stories all the time that that was like probably his all time favorite fish. He said he had it chained to where he could put his hand inside the tank and the fish would literally lay down in his hand. He said, wow. Um, but he said, he said that my mom was cleaning one day when he did that and smelled with the back of uh, the um, the vacuum and scared the fish so bad that it swam away so fast that it actually cut open his hand. Oh, geez. Yeah, with the fin on the back of it. So that's one of his fondest memories, and I believe that that's, that's the fish that got him into the hobby. But he, they had fish. So he said that there was never a time that they didn't have an aquarium. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah, it's always it's always interesting to know, like, you know, asking the guests their origin story, but then trying to figure out, like, the person that got them into it. It's like, oh, they were a fish nerd, and we're talking, like, you know, they got into it in the 60s or the 70s and trying to understand, you know, what, what it was that got them in and maybe, you know, kind of tease out a little bit of maybe if they knew anything, like, kind of what was happening in the times with the hobby that, uh, you know, would pull somebody new into it where, you know, right now, if, um, I would imagine if we, you know, jump forward in the time machine, like 20 years and we ask somebody like, Oh, how'd you get started in the hobby? And if they got started around this time period, you know, they'd reference like, Oh, I don't know if you remember that COVID-19 thing. We were all stuck at home. We were just on YouTube all day long and came across all these fish, fish YouTube people. And it just looked really cool. And that's how I got my start. And I think we'll have like a whole generation of people that will have that story. But again, trying to understand like, you know, two, three, four decades ago, like what, what was, you know, were there any prevailing cultural things out there that just got people into it? Was it, you know, um, whoever the, the Knight Rider actor was, maybe he had an aquarium, you know, when he wasn't driving kit, he was feeding his Oscar in the 55 gallon and that got everybody into the hobby or something like that. <laughs> well, I know, uh, I know my parents were both hippies, so maybe they just like to relax in front of the fish tank. There you go. Probably had a lava lamp next to it, maybe. Uh, I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> good times, good times. Uh, okay, so then, um, y- did you guys have more than the one tank then as a kid? Um, we had the 55-gallon, and then my dad got an iguana that he he decked out the whole house for the iguana. Like they, they, my dad is always, when he does something with for his animals, he does it all the way. Like the 55 gallon, he had a custom painted background that he did ha- by hand. Um, the iguana cage, he built a uh, rafter that went up around the entire perimeter of the ceiling of the, of the house so the iguana could get out whenever he wanted to. Um, at one time, I think that was the only two aquariums that we had. Mm. Okay. What do you know? Kind of. Uh, do you remember what your role was as a kid in in the family aquariums? Um, mostly watching them. Okay. Um, we had a, a at one of the apartment complexes that we lived at because my parents were apartment managers. Um, we had a really big pond. And there was koi in it. And I remember once a year, we would have to clean the pond. And um, it was me and the other kids in the complex's role to try to catch all the crawdads out and try to put them into buckets so they didn't get sucked up by the by the big fire hose that they would use to suck all the water out. Um, I remember sitting there, we would tie strips of uh, strips of bacon to strings and dump it in the pond and then the crawdads would all get on the bacon and we'd pull them out and just put them into a bucket of water that sounds awesome 
Like that sounds so, awesome as a kid, and that sounds awesome right now. Like if somebody was like, "Hey, we're draining a pond. We got crawdads. We're gonna fish with bacon." Like I would, I would. Well, I, we'd we'd finish this podcast, but then I would go and <laughs> help them do that. That sounds like so much fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and the the koi the koi were really cool. Uh, we always had a uh, a big fifty five gallon or uh, trash can on wheels filled with dog food, and we would just take a scoop and dump it into the pond and watch the koi go nuts. Oh boy, man! I bet all those koi breeders are probably having a heart attack if they hear that. <laughs> although, yeah, although cool. that may that might be one of their secrets. They're like, don't tell anybody, but it's all about the old Roy Walmart dog food. That's actually what we feed these champion koi. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Some so, of the stuff you hear from from like 20, 30 years ago mm-hmm. and nowadays are just like, oh my god. So are we talking? Are we talking? You're in Southern Cal. Well, I, well, I know you're in Southern California now, but you know this uh, this particular apartment complex that your parents were managing with the koi pond is that was that also in Southern California? Yeah, that was right by uh, UCR University of California Riverside. Okay. Yeah, that's a um, uh, pretty big college town. That complex is still there, and I believe the pond is still going. Oh man, I'm gonna let's let's Google Map this, dude. All right, so uh, I'm gonna try to talk and not have dead air while I pull up Google Maps. Uh, yeah, because I feel like you know I've had plenty of friends that you know have lived in apartment complexes, family with apart- apartment complexes. Um, I'm from Northern California. And maybe it's because I wasn't in Southern California, but I don't think I've ever seen one that actually had like a, an actual koi pond. Um, I will say shout out to good old Stockton, California, the 209. I went to uh, Delta College there. It's a junior college in Stockton for uh, a couple of years um, straight out of high school. And they had or have a beautiful, hopefully they still have it, but a very, very beautiful koi pond set up. Um, and I feel like I didn't appreciate that nearly enough while I was there. Really, really nice campus for a junior college. Um, but let's go to, would you know the address off the top of your head? Would that just be asking too much? Uh, not the address. I remember the name of the apartment complex. All right, let's do this. So how many koi were in this thing? Like what's, give me your, give me, give me the setup for the koi pond. Was it just kind of a glorified hole in the ground or was it, you know, more, more decorated? Like what you'd see at like a, you know, like, like what I was used to at, at Delta College where it actually had like waterfalls and all those kinds of features. Um, it, it was, uh, I believe there was three levels um, because the, the complex was on a slope and uh, up at the top would mainly be where the crawdads were. There were no uh, fish up at the very, very top, but it would waterfall down into the second tier, which there were koi in. Um, and then there was a bridge that you walked over to get to one side of the complex because the koi pond ran down the center of the complex. And then there was a smaller water, waterfall that would go down into the bottom that would just feed um, straight back up to the top to uh, have, a, have a continuous system. That sounds awesome. All right. So I found Riverside. It's been a couple of years since I've been to Riverside. Went to some facilities in Moreno Valley. Good times. All right. Um, All right, so I'm looking at uh, UC Riverside. What is the name? Would you? What's the name of the complex? Uh, Boulder Crest Apartments. Boulder Crest. I hope somebody listening to this lives in Boulder Crest Apartments. <laughs> yes, here we go. Ooh, did they change the name to University Crest? Uh, they may have. All right. And did you say how many koi were actually in that pond? I believe there was 20 to 30 full-grown wow. koi. That is awesome. I feel like they totally don't make apartment complexes like that anymore. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> that would be amazing. All right, so we've got University Crest Apartment off of Canyon Crest Drive. Yeah, Canyon Crest, and I believe it's Iowa. Uh, Blaine, I see Canyon Crest and Blaine. Oh, yeah, Blaine. Yeah, okay. that's it, Blaine. All right, we're getting somewhere. There's a pool. Yeah, they, uh, they, I believe it starts southwest of the pool. Man, I'm going to be real sad if they filled this thing in, because I'm looking at Google Maps. It's either that or there's just too much tree cover to actually see um, if this is actually University Crest Apartments. But there's a cool, yeah. there's a cool pool right there in the center of it. Yeah, they do have a, uh, a decent-sized pool. Um, is but, it by uh, a church? Is it right next to a church? Yeah, it's right next to a church. They do have a uh, quite a bit of tr- quite a few trees in that central courtyard area, 
Um, have they turned this into like a tourist spot where where people are taking uh, Google map pictures and posting it? That would be amazing. (laughs) Unfortunately, my little, my little guy, I'm holding on to him. I don't see anywhere to drop him. Dang. (laughs) All right. You just got to do recon then. You got to do some recon for me and uh, (laughs) like shoot some video and upload it to your YouTube channel. All (laughs) right. No, man, that sounds so awesome. Like having that would, so not only would like an in washer dryer uh, be a major selling feature for me in an apartment and, and has been, but a, uh, a, a, a freaking sweet koi pond would be pretty awesome too. And so yeah. with, with the crawdads, would you guys, you would just put them back in when you were done cleaning? Yeah, we would just put them back in. Um, we would drain, we would drain one section of the pond um, and move the fish down to another section and we would take all the crawdads out and put them in buckets. And then we would just clean all the muck out of the bottom of the, out of the bottom of the pond and then refill it and move on to the next section. I remember we used to, we used to just about flood the street because they would put, (laughs) they would, they would rent like a 300 foot fire hose and just put it straight out to the gutter and the street. And that's where they put all the water from the pond. And it's like thousands and thousands of gallons. That's awesome. Good times, man. Um, yeah, I totally, yeah, that would be something so cool to have as a feature in your, uh, in your house or in your apartments. And right now I'm, I'm driving on Canyon Crest. I'm not letting this go, man. I'm clearly, everybody's like, man, Randy needs to just move on from trying to see this koi pond. But, um, (laughs) that sounds really cool. Uh, um, as far as like, was it just an annual thing that you guys did or did your parents have more knowledge into like, oh, the nitrates are getting a little out of whack here. We should probably go ahead and, uh, you know, change this koi pond or was it just kind of like a, you know, annual scheduled thing that you guys would just do? Um, I don't think they ever did any testing or anything on the water. Okay. It was, I think it was just, Hey, the water's starting to look really, really murky. We want to see the fish more. <laughs> the pond. So the, my dad would usually, um, he would usually get as many people from the complex who wanted to help out and all the kids always wanted to help out. And then we would do it all day. And then, um, usually the next day he would have like a big cookout over at the barbecue by the pool and have a pool day for everybody who wanted to come out. Your dad sounds legit, man. I'm like, I like this guy. That's, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. He was always a fun guy. Yeah. And, uh, so let's see here. So then your next tank, then, so you had the, you had the 55, you guys had the reptiles, the iguanas, and then it really wasn't until you moved out that you kind of had a tank to your own, right? Yeah. When I, uh, I was about 19 years old, I went and got a little small, little 10 gallon tank, um, had a, uh, a convict cichlid, a pleco, and I believe a coolie loach, but I put the coolie loach in there and I never saw him until probably about a year later when I tore down the tank. Those guys just disappeared. That sounds about right. Yeah, that sounds about right. And then, uh, so then how did you, how'd you progress from there? It was the, it was, you found scape somehow. Yeah. I ended up tearing down the 10 gallon tank. Um, and I, I forgot to say earlier, actually, a couple months before I found Scape, I had gotten a 29-gallon tank, um, and it, it was it was a 29-gallon tank. I also had horrible stocking choice in it. I had a uh, black and red gravel that I took from the that I had sitting in a bag from the 10-gallon tank years before. Um, but I had a uh, an Oscar, another convict cichlid, and another common placostomus. For some reason, always growing up, people told me you always have to have a placostomus in your tank. He's going to clean your tank. That, but they do, yeah, they dude. do so much, so much more <laughs> worse for a small tank than they do good. That's that. Just everybody, everybody has that story, and people that aren't really in tune with the hobby and kind of have like, if you just pulled people on the street. That, you know, if you're like, hey, do you have any like vague idea of how to keep fish? And like, yeah, I think I do. They like undoubtedly nine out of 10 of those people would probably say that, oh, you got to have your cleanup crew. You got to have that that big catfish, that sucker fish in there so he can clean everything up, you know, and I think that's just like somehow somehow that got started. And I, I think it, it started with, you know, there there is something to, yeah, you probably want something on the you know bottom of the water column that's going to eat food that falls, but like not like that thing's only going to live off of other fish's poop and algae and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And that's something that's going to grow two feet long. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have you, um, so it was, um, Dr. Melissa. Oh man, I'm drawing a blank on her last name, but from Florida, the, the, uh, the interview that I did where she talked about the invasive plecos in Florida. 
I haven't gotten that far yet. Um, I've been listening to your podcast a lot more recently while at work. Um, but uh, one is uh, usually about one episode. It usually takes me about eight hours at work to go through because it's really noisy at work. <laughs> or it's because I put you to sleep. It's so boring. <laughs> like, um, I gotta wake back up and uh, and rewind to where where uh, where we left off at. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I enjoy the podcast. Yeah, you got it. When you when you get to that one, and you know, there's some there's some good videos out there. But just the invasive uh, the invasive common plecos. Uh, yeah, I've seen the videos in Florida. On, yeah, I've seen the videos on YouTube. It's yeah. crazy. And the funny thing is, they're actually kind of delicious. So what we need to do is we need to uh, have some Peruvian chefs come up and do some. You know, they need to to go around Florida and these. I think they might even be in Georgia. Um, and some of those other the southern warmer states, and basically say this is how you make pleco soup. It is actually really good. I had that in uh, in Peru and turned that into a uh, a food fish, much like what they try to do with some of the other invasive species that you know traditionally our American palate we're like ah we're not you know we're not used to eating this carp or we're not used to eating snakehead or we're not used to eating um, pleco. You know the the places that they're native to they actually do eat them and they are for a freshwater fish they're actually pretty tasty if you know how to cook them. Well, I know they eat some really other weird stuff out there in Florida and Georgia and everything, so I don't see why not. I mean, I know Florida's been having problems with iguanas, and I, I hear that they call them the chicken of the trees. So. I've I've watched a video of a guy that just goes around and just, you know, they, they catch iguanas and they eat iguanas, and that's, uh, that's the thing. I mean, I, th- I feel like I would try it. But, you know, you, uh, being from the West Coast and not having iguanas everywhere, it's like, man, I feel like you, that's, that's a bit of a hump to get over as you're taking your first bite of iguana. I think I'd be okay with the iguana. The one that really that really weirds me out is the uh, the nutria. I, I know that they hunt nutria and uh, and eat them because they're having a problem over there as well in the Everglades. I I've had I had capybara, which I think is probably going to be pretty close. And, I mean, it's just, from what I remember, it's just kind of like, just chewy meat. I I think the seasonings were good. I think it was cooked like it was supposed to. Um, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't anything like, you know, ah, crazy. Well, one is they're they're you know as they're serving it to us, they're all speaking Spanish, and I'm not picking up on exactly what it is, and I'm just chewing away. And then it's like, oh yeah, and that's the uh, that's the that's the capybara. That's the that's the caiman. That's this. That's that. And it's like, oh, okay, you know, I'm just kind of eating first, and then they tell me what it is later, which I think is probably a pretty decent strategy. Yeah. I think plecos would probably be pretty they're pretty easy to sustain a lot of hungry people if people knew how to cook them because I, I, I breed with costumuses and then man they, they breed like crazy it, <laughs> it, I mean you you might be onto something as far as like maybe maybe the what is it teraglypthes is I think the the genus name for that common pleco um, but you know they they are fairly hardy fairly pro- prolific and maybe there's something to that from an aquaculture perspective where that's like a fish where you know, um, I think it tastes better than tilapia and maybe, and maybe there's more nutrient, nutrient, nutrient value. I don't know. Maybe you could do a combination of tilapia and like the mid top water column, those guys in the bottom, bottom of the, of the, you know, the setups and you can have aquaculture with both of those species going at the same time. I don't know. I'm just a, I'm just a dude with no scientific background, just throwing stuff against the wall. (laughs) I know, right? See what sticks. <laughs> See what I mean. And the problem is, I don't even know if it's going to stick or not. But I should probably. Uh, I do want to have somebody on that that uh, like a professional aquaculture person and just like freshwater aquaculture for you know tilapia or whatever it is, and just kind of you know understand. Um, you know what that's like, and just see things that we're used to in, in our in our hobby see it at scale in mass production like and that could be um you know any of the state run trout far, trout um hatcheries or or anything like that where it's like yeah this is this is our bioreactor and that's like oh that's where our zis biofilter kind of comes from and this is it but it's like in a 100 gallon ju- you know massive container and there's just you know pounds and pounds of like K1 style media and you know just seeing all of those things from our hobby at massive scale in a uh, in a commercial setup. Yeah, that would be really cool. All right, so let's let's veer back to Scape. So tell me, uh, you are the president of Scape right now, right? Yes. So you are clearly a gl- a glutton for punishments if you volunteer yourself to be a president of a fish club. So tell us about Scape. Kind of give us the give us the you know elevator spiel about Scape. Uh, well. Escape was started back in the uh, the two thousands. Um, I joined it in twenty seventeen. Um, a lot of people think it's kind of crazy that I joined and became the president so fast, but 
um, I just kind of fell in love with it. But the, uh, the the original people who started Scape, it was mainly just a couple of uh, a group of aquarium hobbyists that always saw each other at the stores, and they decided to start a forum about it. And then they started meeting at people's houses. Um, it just kind of evolved from there. From there, uh, now we have. On our forum, on on our website, we have over 7,000 registered members, but that's overall from like the last 10 to 15 years. I would say though at any given time, we have probably about 500 to 1,000 active members. Um, before the pandemic hit, we were having monthly meetings every month where we have, uh, we have sponsor stores here in Southern California that um sponsor our club with 10 percent off to all of our members they also donate prizes to our raffle meetings and some of them have space enough to where they can host meetings for us um we would have monthly meetings where uh, we've had meetings where we had close to 200 people show up um on a regular basis we would have usually about 100 members show up that is um, huge yeah it's a it's a really big club um we have <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, um, members bring items that they uh, items that they want to auction off in our auctions. Um, usually, our auctions can run anywhere from an hour and a half to we've had auctions that go six to eight hours at some of our bigger meetings. Um, mostly, a lot a lot of plants that people are trimming out of their tanks because we're mainly an aquascaping club. But then we also have fish breeders. Um, we've had Ulta Nature Systems come out to our uh, our events before the uh, Boost Plant and UNS was actually started out from um, a few members of Scape. Um, so they actually they they like to help out help out and support the club as much as they can. Um, a lot of our members, um, uh, Zach Zach Frank, who's been on your uh, yeah, I saw I saw that Zach was a member, yeah. Yeah, he's been a he's been a member of our forum and our club for a few years now. He's always coming out to our meetings. Um, you should probably just kick him out, though. I mean, to be perfectly honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, hey Rand, Randy said you're out. Yeah, dude. You got, sorry, Zach. You got banned, buddy. Yeah, um, he uh, he used to help us out with getting our booth at the Orange County Fairgrounds for America's Family Pet Expo, um, but I know he's moved on to Sarah Foods, but we we still have our um, connections over at at Expo now, so that's always been really fun too. Um, just overall with the club, the, the, we we try to do as much as possible with the community and try to give back as much as possible with the community uh, to uh, the hobby. All of the proceeds that we get usually either go into presentations or into our raffle meetings. Um, last year in July. We gave away almost three thousand dollars worth of tanks, plants, fertilizers, substrates, um, gift cards, all kinds of crazy stuff. Wow! Yeah, it, it's funny because I feel like when I've looked you guys up before, I felt that you guys were almost a forum first, and then and then would just kind of supplement with some meetings. But it sounds like it's the it's the opposite. You guys were you know started like kind of any other fish club would, but then it, you just really leveraged hard and, and were able to build this forum that is is pretty active by today's standards. Yeah, the uh, the forum is just, it's grown just over years and years. Uh, I think probably the, the best thing about the forum is how old it is. Um, a lot of people have been wanting to redesign our forum or change it up to a modern system. Um, but there's just so much information that we have on our forum from our members that have come and gone. Um, Dr. Anthony Mazarol is a member of our club. Um, he's given us lectures and presentations that uh, we've put on our forum before. Um, different people who've had just success, uh, they just go onto the forum and they post their success, they post their pictures. Um, our members have done really, really great with keeping our forum active and just put, putting so much information out there. Um, I know if you Google a lot of things in the aquascaping hobby, our links to our forum do come up because 
out here in Southern California, um, we were one of the first resources for aquascaping, and it's just it's just grown exponential from then from there, which is great. Just like the hobby. Do you, do you still think that your club is predominantly driven by plant enthusiasts, or do you think has it balanced out a bit more? Where, you know, sure you've got like the, the, the aquatic plant enthusiasts in your name, but it's almost just kind of more like a regular fish club that has just diversified and has people in, in all interests. Um, there, we definitely have a lot more people that are geared toward or more towards the fish side than we used to. Um, it used to be just mainly just aquascaping. Um, when I joined the club, uh, all of our, all of our presentations and everything were always about aquascaping. Um, we, we didn't have meetings as often either. When I started taking over, I started trying to expand on more than just, I kind of felt that, um, doing plant, uh, presentation after plant presentation after plant presentation month after month after month, it was kind of like beating a dead horse with some of our members because some of our members, they already know all this. So I started trying to expand with more more on the fish side, and you know I personally started breeding fish. Um, I started trying to work a little bit more with uh, the club coast that's out here, which is predominantly a fish club. Um, some of our their members now come to our meetings. Some of our members go to their meetings. So it's getting more, you know, all around uh, aquarium club, but mostly. I don't know anybody who doesn't keep plants in their tanks. I mean, even my breeding tanks have plants in my tank and their tanks. Do we all use the, uh, if we don't use them for aesthetic appeal, we use them for their benefits to the tank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No plants are, plants are definitely great. And, um, they help you be a little bit lazy, not, not, not super lazy, but they help a little bit. (laughs) A little bit, unless you set up like a wall stead, and then it can be really lazy. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I actually, I, I want to reset one of those up. Not to digress off escape or anything, but I had my uh, Denali Shrimp King ten gallon that was all wall statted up, um, and uh, had like what did I start with? Three sparkling garamis, and they were actually breeding in there, but I, I wasn't hashing brine shrimp at the time. And this is this is before I joined Aquarium Co op, so it's about two and a half years ago. Um. And yeah, I had fry, but I just never, you know, I never fed them any of the the micro foods or maybe they were, I don't know, maybe they were too small for baby brine shrimp, but nonetheless, like I, I wasn't doing infusoria, infusoria. And so, you know, they just never really, um, nothing ever came of them, unfortunately. And now it's like, man, I wish, uh, now that I want to kind of get more breeders award program points, it's like, God, I wish I still had that tank going and actually, you know, put forth a better effort with those sparkling garamis and just get one more species of uh, a fish to, to lay credit to. I mean... I, it, it, yeah, I mean, because if you don't get them, if you don't get them to June, I was like, you can't even count it. It's like flying into an airport. Like I've been to Minneapolis, Detroit, and all these different airports, but I've never stepped foot in the state, so I can't count it as like I've visited Michigan or have visited uh, Minnesota. As completely ridiculous as that sounds. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I understand that. If I could, uh, if I could pause real quick, so we did say Dr. Anthony Masral, and I've been meaning to give a shout out. So cool, if you'd be so kind as to let me while I interview you, give a shout out to him to the Amazon Research Center. You can find uh, more about the Amazon Research Center at amazonresearchcenter.org. Um, I've got a video on my YouTube channel of a, a tour that I did there. He's They've since done a lot more work on the facility since I was last there. Um, but you know, if you could, go check out the work that they're doing because the whole goal there is to educate, set up this awesome aquarium uh, for the local people of Iquito so that they really can understand and learn more about this you know beautiful bit of the world that they have have there in the Amazon, in the Peruvian Amazon. And so, um, you know, one of their goals is to help people do sustainable aquaculture of ornamental fish, like the discus, like uh, epistogrammas, just all these awesome fish that are native to the area. Um, You know, their kind of goal is let's see if we can basically have wild caught fish that are aquacultured and have those be the export as opposed to going into the Amazon and collecting fish, which you know, data on both sides of that of that particular topic. Nonetheless, I think Anthony and his wife are doing fantastic work. I've donated to them before. Aquarium Co-op has donated to them before. Um, you know, anything that people can do to help that cause, I would highly encourage you just go check it out. AmazonResearchCenter.org. Um, the area has been hit. Uh, you know, working down there is a little tough because of COVID nineteen. Um, but we all know that we're going to get through this, and that you know, Amazon Research Center 
is going to be, you know, a really cool thing to have down there, a really important thing to have of educating the school children, educating the population of, of Iquitos um, about this resource that they have and the fishes that are in the Amazon. So again, check it out, amazonresearchcenter.org. Um, and I feel like, hey, we, we, said, we said his name, so I feel like, you know, we, we, that'd, that'd be a perfect opportunity to talk about Anthony and the uh, Amazon Research Center, cause, and he is a friend of the podcast, so hope yeah, that, they, don't hate me for that one, Cole. Well, he does some really good work, and I know he's very, very passionate about it. He did a uh, presentation for us um, about two months ago, and I know last month he uh, hosted a uh, – because we, we haven't been able to have um, any any types of meetings or anything like that, but he hosted a social distancing swap meet uh, at his house where he, the people came and um, – we're able to set up little booths around his around his little property that he has and sell stuff and everything that he personally sold. All of his proceeds went straight to the research center. That's awesome. Very cool. Was it a, a, a decent? I don't even want to talk about turnout. Uh, no, that that's very cool though. I I think that's an that's an awesome thing to do to just you know in these in these times that we're living in, do what you can to you know help others out. You know, be a fish nerd and still have some sense of community and you know some some measure of like in-person contact i think that's so good for us to to have not a, not only for the hobby but just you know as people yeah all right so scape um what is and actually the funny thing is as we're talking about this i've got skate pulled up and i see the most recent post is by seattle underscore aquarist and i'm almost positive that that's roy steve stevold stevold from uh, GSAS, I think he's our vice president right now, but Roy's served in like various capacities. And uh, I believe what he's doing is he's posting, yeah, we have a, uh, for our our club. Um, so you guys let us actually promote our club. Um, uh, so it's Randy Carey. He's going to be presenting on breeding egg scatters, which sounds like an awesome talk that I definitely want to uh, be a part of. But yeah, I noticed that there and I'm like, oh, that's Roy. Yep. And sure enough, that's him in the avatar. <laughs> Yeah, he um, he posts uh, every couple of months on um, whenever they have events up there. Um, lately, it's been for the free lectures um, and stuff like that because uh, because of the COVID and everything like that. But um, he's been posting for a while now on Scape, and I've been wanting to try to have a club. I want to call it a club field trip to um, go up the coast. I want to stop at. Uh, I believe it's the uh, Aqua Forest in San Francisco. Um, the ADA a, store? Yeah, the ADA yeah. store. I want to stop there and check out all of their mm-hmm. tanks and all of their aquascapes. Um, try to talk to Wet Spot about possibly going up and seeing their operation. Uh, hopefully, hopefully be able to get a little bit of a an inside look at some of it with with uh with a group of club members and i know a lot of people want to go up and see aquarium co-op and then i'd love to go to one of the one of the meetings up there that that sounds like a lot of fun yeah and um if you're going to be in san francisco with your with your crew now i haven't been to aqua forest uh when i was down there visiting zenzo he took me to a couple different spots uh one of them was ocean aquarium so if you guys are going to be in san francisco you absolutely have to go see justin and uh, his store ocean aquariums and it's just it is a uniquely san francisco experience and it's it's like you take this old vibe that san francisco is so known for like me growing up in northern california going there as a kid you know that that feel that these old san francisco stores have were just everything is hodgepodge it's all tight spaces and everything and it's just everything is just jammed in close together, but it's so uniquely that city. And then on top of that, it's an aquarium store. It is like, I would, if, if I could even, if I could walk to that place uh, from like a work or home distance, I'd probably go in there like every single day, if not, you know, several times a week, just to walk in there, talk with Justin, see all the cool stuff he has. So, you know, whenever, whenever you guys do that, if you're going to go into San Francisco, you absolutely have to go into that store as well. Yeah, I'll definitely have to put it on the list. Yeah, and sadly, I haven't even been to the wet spot yet. So I've I've lived in the Pacific Northwest for I don't know, like five, six years now, uh, having moved up from from San Diego, uh, and then you know, obviously being in the hobby again for about three years, I haven't I haven't taken that trip down to wet spot. I absolutely need to because that's just another like you know nationwide. Everybody knows the wet spot, um, and so yeah, just it, it's kind of in my backyard and just haven't done it yet. So. 
Yeah, and there's, well, plus I'm also running out of fish stores to go to. <laughs> with being the president of Escape and through networking and the sponsor stores, I've been to just about every single store in Southern California um, and some of the stores in out in Arizona. So it, it would be cool to go up north and see some of the stores up there. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's definitely awesome. What are you noticing now pre-COVID? How was your local fish store scene in Southern California? Um. So there's there's a, a couple of fish stores that seem to be a little bit you know less busy, um, but dude, they all seem to be pulling through, and a couple of them actually seem to be doing it almost even better. Um, two of our main sponsor stores, um, there's a CK Fish World in West Covina. They're like our main sponsor store. They take care of all of our members. So the owner there, Peter, knows most of us by name, which is. I think astounding because of how many of us there are. Um, they uh, they never they never had to shut their doors. They they were uh, they had to limit their occupancy of how many people were able to go in. But at times uh, I saw lines of people waiting to go in, and almost like people were wanting to support their local businesses even more. Um, and also Nolan's Aquarium in Santa Ana, he actually um, decided to shut down his store to people physically coming in but he was doing website orders and he started doing free deliveries and um, would be doing uh, web interviews with people to walk through their store so they could still see inside their store without actually having anybody to need to come in um, that way there's you could stop it stop any spread of covid mm. um, he said that a he seemed to have more and more people wanting to order from him rather than going someplace else just because they, they knew that he was going to be struggling during these times. So the, the whole community actually seems to be pulling behind their local fish stores pretty cool. Yeah, it's I mean, the, the tough thing with COVID that, you know, it set it set the hobby up, the industry to do well because people were staying home. And, you know, they're finding whatever they're, they're finding. I, I would have to imagine that a lot of people just browsing through YouTube and sheer, you know, boredom of being at home have kind of come across, you know, various fish keepers and are like, oh, that, that seems like something cool I should do. Or maybe their recommendations in parenting magazines of here's something you could do that is educational, interactive, and just good looking for your house. Get yourself an aquarium. So, you know, we, we kind of have this demand, but then the supply aspect of it, like basically every single industry um, you know, if you didn't have enough inventory built up with this increase in demand, you know, you're starting to run out of products, starting to run out of foods. Um, and then the, the actual fish aspect of it, you know, with the decreased number of flights, like drastically decreased number of flights coming from, uh, from Southeast Asia, from South America, um, you know, from Europe, you know, these, these sources where we can get fish. Like when you, when you talk to somebody and it's like, oh, epistogrammas come from, is it the Czech Republic, I think, where, or Poland? It's one of those, it's one of those Eastern European countries where you're like, really, we get a lot of epistogrammas from, from Eastern Europe. I had no idea. And, you know, when, when the flights start to decrease like that, like seriously hampers a fish store's ability to actually provide selection, you know? And so, you know, myself and, and Robert, you know, we're looking at these fish buy lists for aquarium co-op and it's like, you know, usually they're an, aqua they're an Excel spreadsheet and there's, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of fish that you can choose from. And at its very worst, I mean, the South American cichlid with list, which is normally like, you know, 75 species deep, it's down to like 10. You're like, wow, like you, it's, you know, it really, really tough. And so that's where you really hope that you've got a good community of people that are breeding fish and, and being able to, to bring them into the store. So you at least have, you know, a little bit more variety or, um, you know, a better amount of supply of fish for, for new people getting into it. Cause it's, it's hard to have an aquarium hobby if you don't have fish or plants for that matter. Yeah. Um, I haven't really seen to, uh, much of a shortage in either fish or plants. I know uh, UNS is actually UNS and Boost pl uh, Boost Plant. They're local to here in Southern California, and a lot of a lot of the stores have uh, accounts with them. So I don't think that you know we didn't have any problem with uh, products from UNS or Boost Plant or the aquascaping industry. And I know uh, Southland Aquatics is out here in Southern California, and they do a lot of wholesaling. So we didn't get hit too much with a shortage of livestock. Um, what really helps you guys is that you have LA, that you have LAX. Yeah. 
And yeah, LA, LAX and yeah. Ontario Airport. For, for I know I know that getting shipments of whether it's fish or plants into LAX is like half the cost of getting into Seattle or anywhere else in the country. It is it is ridiculous, and so that that really is. Um, you know, aside from the sunshine, LAX has got, or Los Angeles has got a lot of things like traffic and, you know, high cost of living, but that proximity to LAX and that port is really, really valuable. Yeah. And, um, uh, Long Beach, Long Beach yep, is one Long... of the biggest seaports. Oh in yeah. The country. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that absolutely helps. Uh, and I, I mean, I just feel fortunate enough that we're in, we're in Seattle on the West coast. So, you know, as far as flights go, we at least have some of those flights coming from, coming from those regions. So yeah, good times. So what is your, um, so yeah, everybody should go check out scape. Uh, I've just been kind of perusing as, you know, I try to do my good job as a host to listen to you so that we can engage in conversation, but also like check out scape, check out, you know, the, the main subject of what we're talking about to see if I could find any, uh, cool stuff, but you know, check out Scape. Um, definitely a good active forum here to uh, to just you know nerd out if you need uh, more places to go to. Like, hey, I need I need to get some more fish or plant uh, plant nerdiness in my life. Uh, scapeclub.org. Um, now, Cole, tell me about your where are you at currently, right? So I know we I had kind of said earlier that you are shifting a little bit from that advanced um, aquascaping kind of desire to more fish breeding. So what what brought that about, and where are you at right now, and what's that kind of you know, micro journey been like? Uh, well, th- th- I originally started breaking down some of my aquascapes when um, I used to be a, a service technician for automatic doors and I was in a car accident while at work and I uh, hurt my back pretty bad and I was out of work for about two years. And at the beginning of that, I started doing more aquascapes because I had so much time on my hands, but then my back wasn't for wasn't helping me out with the maintenance so uh i think the the last major aquascape i broke down was my 40 gallon uh dutch aquascape um and then i had started getting more into breeding epistogrammas and um, dark night rams and then um uh, towards the end of my injury i started going back to work and i ended up having to stop breeding because i was traveling the country um doing woodworking and carpentry so i uh can you can you real breeding. quick can you say what uh, what kind of woodworking you were doing because i think this was uh, awesome when you told me uh we built high end axe throwing units high end axe throwing units so that's AXE axe throwing units. When you said that, that, that is so awesome, man. Uh, yeah, that's that's super cool. That's like I'm sure there's like a different whole like axe throwing podcast world that they could dive into that for hours and hours. But all right, back back on your train of thought, man. Sorry, sir. Yeah. So um, yeah, when I was traveling around building the building the axe throwing units, and I wasn't able to keep up with the upkeep upkeep with my fish tanks my fiance was actually taking care of i believe 19 tanks at the time while i was traveling so i ended up breaking down a lot of those but at the beginning of the year when the pandemic hit um the whole entertainment industry just fell through so bowling alleys closed bars closed pretty much everywhere that we would install some place for you to throw axes they closed so in March, I started getting back into breeding. Um, so now I believe that now in my fish room, I believe I have 20 tanks. I have four tanks outside of the fish room. Um, I'm currently breeding pitch black rams, long fin Bex rams, which I, I, I feel that they need a new name. It's a, a cross between long fin electric blue rams and pitch black rams. And then I have I have some gold rams that came from the bl- pitch black rams. Um, I'm also working on breeding spotted Congo puffers. Mm. I have some humpback dragon puffers that I'm going to try to start breeding as well. Um, I have pygmy sunfish. I have a pair of discus that I'm hoping will start spawning soon. And then I'm also trying to uh, condition some autumn angels and some epistogramma abacaxis. Oh, very nice. So let's let's go back to before you broke down the fish room uh, when you were doing a lot of just the um, long fin. You, you call them pitch black rams, right? Yeah, there's okay. a, there's a few different strains out there. Oh, okay, so wow, that's that's probably a whole other uh, little tangent we can go down. Uh, what what epistogramma species were you working with? 
Um, at that time, I had uh, mainly cockatorties. I had some of the uh, the super reds. I had orange flash, and then I had the white golds. Awesome. That's those are such like I I go back and forth with like there's this you know pure side of me where I only want to work with like the wild ones, and then there's this realist side of me where it's you know I want I want to work with fish. I want to breed them. I want to have success, but I also want to make sure that they have a home that you know are very easy to once you get. 30, 40, 50 speed, you know, fish fry or whatever that you have a good place that you can actually take them to. And, you know, uh, like the cockatoides, the agazizii, all the ones that are super, super popular in the retail stores. I feel like, you know, that just makes a lot of sense to kind of work with those because they're just that much easier to make sure that they go, you have an easier time getting them to a home. Yeah. Um, I've noticed lately, at, at least out here in Southern California, um, Personal hobby breeding has actually switched away from the cockatoides just because of how regularly available they are in all of the stores. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally sure that there are those ebbs and flows where something gets popular, right? Uh, there's a decreased supply, so you have, a, you have a very high price. Everybody sees that high price, and they go, oh, I'm going to chase that. Um, and I'm going to produce that, or it, it may not even be that it's like the highest price, but it's, oh, I can get, you know, there, there's demand for this. So yeah. we, everybody gets set up. You start breeding and the market gets flooded and then all of a sudden it's, oh, we don't really need these as much anymore. So then, you know, you got to switch to to whatever the next thing is or try to be like the early adopter um, and kind of be that, you know, see the, see the next wave before people are actually working with it. Yeah, I know that a lot of the um, the Borelli and the uh, the Vieta, um, those are those have been more and more popular in the club, it seems. Mm, interesting. Do you have any, uh, what were kind of your tips and tricks with, uh, with Epistogrammas to have success with those? Um, so, uh, a lot of people do, do kind of question my methods for when I breed because I follow very, very old school methods of breeding. Like they, my dad taught me a lot of the ways that I take care of my tanks. Um, I don't, I, I use tap water for breeding and I don't even condition my tap water, um, I was always taught don't put excess chemicals into your into your water. So when like when conditioning, you know, high protein foods, just like always, you know, if you have live foods, that's best. Um, but when I do my water changes, it goes straight from the tap into the tank through a 50 foot Python water change system. Can, can I assume um, can I assume some context here of you are in Southern California, so your water um, is probably pretty hard and a uh, pretty high pH relative to like where epistogrammas come from in the wild. Yeah, yeah. The, my, my pH comes out, I believe, 7.6. The KH and GH are about 7 or 8 each. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the TDS is about 190, which isn't too bad. Yeah. Um, for for the majority of fish out there, I actually have really really great tap water, mm-hmm. but um, uh, my my cockatoides never had any problems breeding. Um, the rams that I'm breeding right now, the person that I got them from, he told me that he always had to drop the TDS down to a hundred and soften the water for them to breed. But I have. I have like three or four batches of babies right now that have all been breeding just fine and well over a hundred grams that have are at maturity now. <laughs> yeah. And that's where it's like chasing parameters. And I'm sure like, don't get me wrong. There's going to be like the soda Lake cichlids that have to be in like a, a pH of like 9.5 and it's like 115 degrees. Like that's one, like, you know, there are fish at the extremes where you probably got to get pretty close and probably just can't do your tap water. But I think for so many of the fish that we do have readily available, um, focusing on, you know, consistency the cleanliness of the water, right? Like good husbandry practices, as opposed to trying to chase those parameters. Um, you know, I feel pretty fortunate that, you know, I like the South American fish. And so my, my water here is basically rainwater, um, you know, really, really, uh, really, really neutral, like 7.0, 6.8, somewhere around there. And just really sets me up well for discus and, and, um, and, uh, epistogrammas. But I, I kind of, I, I totally get where you're coming from as far as like, yeah, just go straight from your tap water. Um, you know, my question would be on the chloramine side. I don't have chloramines. I've just got a very, very small amount of chlorine in my water. So I know that could be sometimes a bad thing for us, but, or for fish rather, 
but I mean, your proof is in the pudding, right? Like I'm saying these things, but clearly like you have success with your methods. And I can only imagine then that your consistency, your husbandry practices are probably just on point and the fish are super happy and are like, well, let's, let's get it on and make some babies because we feel comfortable in this environment. Yeah, I always, uh, that's what I, what I always try to tell people is you don't necessarily try to chase perfect parameters you know if the fish are happy they're gonna do what they do in nature um you know just try to have a healthy environment for the fish um i've never did, i've used tap water from almost all of southern california i've lived in so many different places here um i've never really had issues with the majority of fish but i, I also i also tell people to do their research and try to make, make their best guess um, best educated guess. So like you said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily tell somebody to go run out and buy a pair of wild heckle disc discus and try to put it in tap water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I, wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't tell people to go out and spend like 800 bucks on Ultim Angels and put them in straight into tap water. They, they, the Ultim Angels can actually be acclimated to tap water, but you know, like I said, you got to make your best educated guess and you know, find out where they're coming from. I always tell people to, to ask the, the parameters of where the fish were bred. Um, you know, if the fish were bred in really, really, really soft water, you're probably going to have to at least start out with really soft water. Yeah, I think, I think that knowing your source of your fish is huge, whether they're wild or if you're actually getting more likely, more often than not, you know, people are not buying wild fish, although they are out there. Like Carl and Tetras, a lot of them are wild. Um, but you know, if, if they're coming from just these long lineages of like breeding stock from, you know, let's say it's somewhere in the Midwest, which the Midwest typically has liquid rock, very hard water, then, you know, the South American fish that are breeding for a breeder in the Midwest, they're not, you know, unless he's specifically running RO or he's doing something with his water, like that's kind of what they're used to now. Yeah. So yeah, that, that, that bit of research is, is very, very important. And, uh, what, I mean, any, anything else that, you know, kind of draws controversy with what you do for breeding? Um, not too much. I think that's probably the main controversy. People are always shocked when I tell them I go straight from the tap to the tank. Uh, that, I, 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 the, the, every do you have, once that, in a do you while, have that on a t-shirt from the tap to the tank? Cause I feel like that's a, that's a t-shirt slogan. I, I should, you know, bumper sticker. <laughs> Hashtag tap to tank. <laughs> you know, every once every once in a while i find like an og aquarius aquarist who when i tell them yeah i don't use prime i don't i don't dechlorinate my water they're just they they, they understand but the majority of people they've they, they most of the people in the hobby i feel like they've been in the hobby and like they started in like the last 20 years so they they've been in a hobby where all of these products are readily available um like a lot of my husbandry and stuff like that, I've learned from people back when they had to do everything themselves. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my techniques are just, you know, and people told me don't, don't put, don't put excess chemicals in your tank. So I, I don't put dechlorinator. Um, when I, ha when I have problems with ick, I turn the temperature up over 85. I don't treat ick with meds. When I have bloat, I feed peas. Um, if I start seeing the, my fish looking lethargic or anything, I start putting garlic into their food. Um, I have, I have organic bee pollen, which is a really, really super food. Mm. What do you do? Uh, what's your quarantine procedure then for, for new fish? Any, any meds or do you just do quarantine tank or do you just go full up, you know, let, let's go and you just put them in whatever community tank they're going to live in or with any other inhabitants? Um, usually right now I usually have just species only tanks and the majority of my breeding tanks are either are 10 gallon tanks and I always have some spare, uh, some to spare. Usually if I bring in any new fish, I usually bring in at least a pair at a time. So they'll get their own tank. Um, so I don't really have to worry too much about quarantining. So, and I always have spare sponge filters, so they'll get a brand new sponge filter and a tank all by themselves. And, um, usually if I have any problems, it's usually contained to that one tank mm -hmm. yeah that's that's kind of what i find myself doing too like i definitely keep um i'll keep meds for those scenarios when something maybe does break out but for the most part i've got the i've got you know usually one or two spare tanks that i can put something in and just let it chill for you know a week or two weeks hit it with some salt initially and then kind of move on um do you do any salt 
Um, every once in a while, I'll do salt if I have like a, a fish with like a bad fungal issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and I find like fungal or bacterial infections, salt works great. Um, and salt, you know, people have known about salt for years. Uh, I know they could, I believe somebody told me that they used to do a saltwater dip on their freshwater fish, similar to how what saltwater people do with their cor- corals with freshwater. Interesting. Yeah, I think I think salt is pretty much the only thing. Maybe they might use a med down in Peru at these exporters. Like they've just got the big bags of salt, and they go around and they. Um, I want to say they had like the deli style cups of salt just chilling in the tanks, and like that's just kind of that. That's like their go to is salt. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So I feel the majority of stuff out there can be taken care of with without without excess chemicals. So that's what I try. Where, so I'm really curious to know the sourcing of the, you know, Pitch Black, Dark Knight, uh, Bex Rams, because I know about a, what was it like a year and a half ago, two years ago, I, I want to say that like to get those things, the prevailing, um, you know, whispers on the internet were that you either had to go to Canada, because somehow Canada was getting them, but they were all coming from Israel. Right. So, you know, your source, like when did you get them? And, you know, don't, don't say your source by name, but like, how did your source get them? Um, and just kind of walk me through that. Well, when I first had them, which was about a year and a half ago, I had true dark night rams. And um, those I got from Nolan's Aquarium. Somehow he got in four of them and I bought all four of them. Um, And luckily for me, I ended up with one male and three females and I was breeding them. And um, Dark Knights, the Dark Knight strain comes from a breeder named Marco. And Marco went to Dan Ziger Farms in Israel to source them from, I believe his name's Shahar. The owner of Danziger Farms, he's the one who started the uh, German Black Rams. And um, Mar- uh, Marco's Dark Knights, the, what makes them so special is that they breed true. They, they uh, Just about 100% of your fry will turn out looking just like the parents. Oh, wow. Um, they, 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 their strengths and what I see is weaknesses in that in that line. I, I I had my my rams were awesome, um, but I wasn't getting really high fry survival rates, and I think that might be because of how true they breed. I think that the line might need an increase in its gene pool. Um, then there's the pitch black rams. The pitch black rams come from Tom Tom Mueller, um, Coral Bandit out in New Jersey. Um, he also got his stock from Shahar Danziger in Israel. Um, the difference is, is that his, when they breed, you'll get gold rams that come out in the fry. And the reason why that is, is that he used some long fin gold rams that he bred into the black rams to try to increase the gene pool. And then also the solid gold body pattern on the gold rams. He was trying to transfer the solid body pattern into the black rams to create a solid black and also try to get some of the long finage into the black rams. So um, my rams, I have a couple of pairs that breed about 75% black and about 25% gold. But the, the gold rams that do come out from the black parents are probably some of the best looking gold rams that I've seen. Um, and then the Bex Rams are a creation of Coral Bandit. Um, he took some long fin electric blue rams and crossbred them with his uh, pitch black rams to create a new strain. And that's what Bex stands for. It's an acronym for uh, Black Electric Cross BEX. As we talk, I am on Aquabid right now. And sure enough, because like, I'm trying to find like, well, one, if we can bring it back to scape, does anybody on scape or anywhere, you know, of for that matter, do they have like photo comparisons and just like one image shot of these different varieties of the, you know, quote unquote, let's just say a blackened Ram, if you will. Cause I think that'd be really cool to see. But uh, right now, Aquabid, 
we could buy it now for 60 bucks from Coral Bandit <laughs> in yeah. in uh, Boston Spa, New York. Um, the Bex Black slash EBR Cross. So they're actually right now available uh, on Aquabid. And so he does have his pictures up. It's a cool looking ram. It's definitely like a bluish, more bluish, um, but it's got those, you know, dark patches in the head, a little bit on the uh, dorsal and the uh, pelvic fins. Yeah, his his pictures don't do him justice. Um, they they look so much better in video. Um, I have a couple of videos up on my Instagram page. Um, the females are almost they almost look like female pitch black rams because of how dark they are. But they have a uh, a bluish shimmer to them and a little bit of purple on their belly, and then their fins are amazing. But the males. Um, People have been telling me that I should nickname them the Avatar Rams because their face like glows bright, bright blue. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, they're they're probably some of the most beautiful Rams I've seen, and I, I have a feeling as they become more, more available, that um, I think that they're going to become more popular than the pitch black Rams or the Dark Knight Rams. Well, it's it's, it's like mildly goofy that you know for the most part in this hobby the more color the more fluorescence, the more vibrancy, the better. And then here we have, we've taken a fish that is normally, you know, very vibrant and has all those colors. And then we've like really, you know, sought after like darkening them up, <laughs> you know, like muting yeah. out their their main body color. I think you still keep a lot of that fluorescence, like you're saying with the with the face, the blue, the blue faces. Um, but it, it just seems, we, it just seems interesting. Like I definitely appreciate these fish, um, but it's just funny that, you know, we it, it's with this particular guy, you know, this fish. It's like we've almost flipped what we want a little bit on its head. Yeah, um, I think what it is, I think the main draw towards the uh, Dark Knights and the Black Rams is they're just how black their body can be. But then some of them get super, super red fins mm. and uh, you don't really see the red finage on normal rams. Um, and it's. Like, like some of the, I believe Coral Bandit is trying to work on a strain of what he's calling red rams, where he's trying to crossbreed different different rams to try to get that main trait out of the from the fins more into the body to try to create an actual red ram. Tell me that there's a very funny irony in that he does nothing with saltwater and corals, but he just has that name on Aquabid. <laughs> because <laughs> that would that would just be like a, a fantastic troll of i'm gonna go on aquabit and i'm gonna name myself coral bandit and uh i i do nothing with corals <laughs> yeah well, that's, that's, one of these days i'll have to ask him um how he how he came up came up with his name i talk with him quite a bit through email um a, lo a lot of my stock has come from him because he, he's got he's got some really really quality rams and he, there's videos of his fish room on youtube but it's not directly through him um i believe if you just type in coral bandit on youtube you'll you'll get a couple of links to different videos but his fish room is is amazing i mean he he breeds apistos he breeds rams um i believe he does the electric blue acara and uh i think he's been working on um albino dantum angels nice but in, in the videos mostly all you see is rams and it's he's got like probably thousands of rams in his tanks well i mean he's doing something good like shout out to coral bandit his positive feedback percentage on aquabit is 99.2 percent with 258 overall feedback rating really good uh he's got 184 unique users that have rated him so gotta be doing something right to uh to get that that uh that much you know that much love I guess the only, the only question I would have, and I'm sure that he's probably experimented with this, but his pictures, he uses a, a purple towel for the background. I wonder I wonder if there's another color. And again, I'm just completely oblivious. He probably already has tried it out. Maybe purple is the best. But I wonder if there was another color for like a background that might make these things pop a little bit more. But, you know, honestly, it's probably to the point where like these are still so popular that that's not even an issue. It's just like, yeah, you get a, get a decent clear picture up and people will be like, oh, yeah, that's what it is. I'll buy it. Yeah, um, I know the, uh, the the long fin Bex. They've been getting more. I've been seeing them more and more on the uh, from people on the Facebook groups, um, which I know he, he he's starting to get that line out there. It, it's still a relatively new line that he made. Um, so it, I uh, I'm st I still have yet to have a full mature batch come out. I have a batch that is just now starting to get its coloration from them. 
Um, so I'm really curious to see how they breed, whether or not they breed true with them being, being a cross between the pitch blacks. Mm. He's, he's got a, he's also got some long fin gold Rams and the, the very first picture they like, look, he must've hit him with a flash for this shot, but really, really pretty colors coming off these fish. Very like angelic, you know, bright whites and whatnot, and some really nice blue iridescence in the tail. So he's got some, definitely got some nice looking fish in, uh, that he's got available on Aquabid. So anybody listening to this, if you're interested in, uh, in these Rams, um, one, one question would be, I know typically, or the prevailing wisdom is that with Rams, you want them to be a little bit hotter. So in, kind of in the, you know, that discus range, uh, 80, like, you know, low mid eighties, uh, is that where you keep your Rams at? Um, I keep my whole fish room set to about 82. Um, but you, usually when I start getting to where, um, uh, I'm going to start rehoming them or I'm going to start selling them. I drop, I drop the temperature in the tanks down to about 78. Um, I've had rams breed and do just fine in like 75 to 76 degrees as well. They're pretty, pretty hardy fish. And the, the way that I try to breed them and I try to take care of them, I try to make them even more hardier so people have the best luck as possible. Um, so I, I think that that might be one of the things that's getting kind of outbred from them. Just as just like the soft water tendencies and stuff like that. Just like how 15, 20 years ago, the, the most common discus liked really warm temperatures and soft water. But nowadays you can, most of the common discus that you find can be kept just fine in just standard aquarium water. Well, it, it's crazy. Like catching these fish in the wild, like I brought fish back home and I'm catching, you know, uh, discus are coming out of the same water as these epistogrammas, the same water as um, these giant autos, the same water as, you know, these other fish that I brought back, these angelfish. And I didn't think twice to put any of the other fish in a tank with a heater. But of course, the discus, I did. And I still continued to have them at about 82, 83, I think. But everything else, like, doing pretty darn fine within like a month of having the epistogrammas that I brought. I brought back like this little mini colony. I really wanted the epistogrammoides, but that one didn't make it out of the exporter, unfortunately. And so I got kind of this, uh, you know, collection of uh, like three or four different wild uh, epistogramma species. And whether it was a cross or a true like um, bitiniata or whatever it was, um, I did have success with uh, with a spawn of, of epistogrammas and raised up like 30 some odd fry, I think, that um, one of my GSAS members and, and podcast guest, uh, Eric and Kathy Olson, I gave them all the fry, I gave them all the epistogrammas because they're just super in love with epistogrammas. And I was so happy to see them go to them because I wanted to kind of do something a little bit different. Um, and yeah, like they were never in a tank with a heater. And they weren't nearly, you know, their tanks weren't as warm as the, uh, as the discus and yet they thrived and they bred. Yeah. I, I think the, I think most people are just trying to mainly chase it. Like you said, chase the parameters. Um, when I, I, I feel like, uh, the majority of fish they're they, they live through some pretty outrageous seasons and stuff in the wild. I mean, uh, the, the Amazon, it gets hit with some pretty crazy rainfall, which the rain that falls is usually quite a bit colder than the actual river. So they, I feel that they can handle temperature swings a lot better than a lot of people give them credit for. <laughs> well, even, even within the river, like when we we're, you know, wading out into the water, like next to the shore, you, you would have like three or four different water temperature kind of gradients as you're just moving across this small Creek. And it's not all one consistent, one consistent temperature. Now, as we have this conversation, am I going to go home and unplug that heater from that discus tank? More than likely not. <laughs> but, you know, do I chase any other parameters with that tank? Absolutely not. It is just my straight tap water. It's on the auto water change system. So it happens to go through a carbon block and a, um, and a, just a sediment filter, but I have, and would have no issue filling that tank up with water straight from my tap. Like I'd obviously want to get it to a close temperature. I don't want to shock them or anything, but um, I, you know, I wouldn't put any dechlorinator in their tank or anything like that. Um, so I feel totally comfortable doing straight from tap to tank, hashtag tap to tank for them. But there's something about, there's still something about that temperature though, where I, I would just, you know, I'd be a little skittish. And part of it is these are like a holy grail fish for me kind of thing. And I really want them to do well. And I'm being very, very patient with them because I want to have them for a long time and eventually be able to, uh, to breed them. Like, uh, Dean who went on the trip with us, his, his wild discus from the year before finally started breeding and producing young for him. So, you know, for me, it's just totally a patience thing, but 
yeah, to circle back, I would just be a little scared to, to <laughs> unplug that, even with everything we've just talked about. Yeah, you will. If it, there are, like you said, I mean, there are certain fish that you gotta, you gotta try to do a little bit more for them than you would for some of the other fish. And those are the rarities that are like, I'm hoping that more and more people do get these rarities and start breeding them more. So we have them, you know, aquacultured for the hobby by the hobby. Oh, hundred percent, man. Absolutely. man. I think that's so cool. If, if, you know, we get more and more fish rooms popping up and, you know, more, uh, you know, more breeders and local clubs and all that fun stuff. I think that'd be fantastic. Um, cool. When you, when you do have your fish available, are they going to kind of, you know, select local stores? Are you making them available on scape? Do you have a handle on Aquabid where you sell them? Um, I haven't gotten into Aquabid just yet. Um, I, uh, I only re- recently got my pairs about six, seven months ago, so I'm just now getting to where my first couple of batches are sexable to where I can start uh, putting them together as pairs. Um, so I'm gonna I'm going to start a uh, start selling on Aquabid as well as offering um, shipping just through my Instagram. I post a lot on uh, the Facebook Ram groups as well. Um, I actually have I have a waiting list of that probably counts for just about every black ram that I have available right now. Um, oh, that's awesome. What do you yeah. have? Do you have an, uh, an Aquabid created? So when you eventually do start posting, I can tell people like we can say right now, like it's Cole 85 on Aquabid, like look for that guy. Um, I, I, I should be sticking with Cole 85 when I do create it. Um, okay. I, I, I do have an Aquabid that I've bought and stuff through and it's Cole 85. So that, <laughs> there we go. Be the same. There we go. Cole, Cole 85 for Aquabid. So yeah, if, uh, if anybody's interested in the future and you see that name pop up, you know, you've, you've heard it straight from Cole's mouth of, uh, kind of what he's doing and, uh, yeah. So Cole, man, this has been fantastic talking about your experiences in the hobby, talking about scape. Um, people should definitely go check out the scape clubs forum. And if you're in the Southern California area, definitely join. And, you know, when we can finally start meeting in person again, you know, definitely attend these meetings. Uh, and just a lot of fun talking about uh, your experiences with epistogrammas and black Ram. So I've had a lot of fun, Cole. Um, I definitely appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, man. Um, we'll also, do you want me to link your YouTube channel as well? Just your YouTube, your Instagram, Scape, all that good stuff for people? Um, maybe just my Instagram and Scape. Um, I've been building up my Insta- my YouTube. I've got stuff that I need to do on there before uh, before I try to advertise too much of that. Um, <laughs> sure but, thing. But my, but my YouTube is on my Instagram. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right, man. Well, cool. Thank you very much, man. I've really enjoyed our time together. All right. Well, thank you.